I uh, want to acknowledge Donald Abrams. I think uh, Donald is, is the gold standard that we all seek to achieve here. Um, and he's doing clinical trials, which are very difficult. I mean, folks have, just have no idea how hard it is to do clinical trials. I work a lot with mice because mice always keep their appointments. <laughs> so uh, let's try to make a commitment to giving those six patients. Okay? So go out there and help them give those six patients. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit of a bend here. I, I uh, primarily do uh, neuromuscular disease and I, I run the ALS Center at the University of Washington. And my interest in cannabis. Uh, really, I kind of backed into this because there is really no good treatment for ALS, which is a horrible disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, I'm sure you folks have heard of it. And kind of like Donald, uh, with, with cancer and HIV, those were also horrible diseases. Um, HIV now fortunately has uh, triple therapy, some treatments, many of the cancers don't. But when you're stuck with a disease like ALS, you're looking as a physician for something to help these people. and. Um, I remember from my youth how much cannabis dried out my mouth. That's actually <laughs> what got me thinking about this. Because these people can't swallow the normal saliva that we all produce. Uh, and things that we take for granted, you normally just continually swallow your saliva. They come to clinic drooling with, you know, taking a nap and dry their saliva. And I thought, hmm. We use anticholinergic drugs, but the anticholinergic drugs have a lot of side effects. Then I started to uh, think about pain and spasticity, and I, and I looked at the literature at the time, this was about 10 years ago, and it was so compelling, it was so compelling, that I could not not get involved in this uh, studying medical marijuana. It's really, uh, I just felt like I was ethically obligated, and frankly, since this talk is really on the politics of pot, doing research in medical marijuana, cannabis, as it's more appropriately called, is really a pain in the neck. Uh, I have a graduate student who now has his PhD, I should acknowledge him, Neil Agarwal, who can now officially be called Dr. Agarwal. He's a really fine young man um, from, of all places, uh, Muskogee, uh, Oklahoma, so I'm laughing about that if you're the old Metal Panthers song. But uh, Sunil's PhD was done uh, under my supervision, studying the, the, the geographical usage of medical marijuana. We haven't published it yet, it should out in the next year or so. Uh, but in order just to get that study done, we had to have an attorney on our, on our review panel, and that was Douglas Hyatt, another man I want to acknowledge. Uh, <laughs> Douglas couldn't make it here today uh, because he's so busy. Uh, and his partner, Jeffrey Steinborn, as well. Uh, and I will tell you, as a physician, uh, I didn't used to think that people were unfairly prosecuted for using marijuana, but now I do, and I've testified in court on probably, God knows, 20 or 30 <laughs> cases now. Thank you. But again, this is the type of stuff that is, if you're a human being with any moral, ethical basis, you have to do this stuff. I've seen people, uh, and not kids, I'm talking about adults in their 60s, 70s, who are prosecuted for using marijuana, and, and a lot of this is done legally. I've, I've seen patients who have authorizations, who police found cannabis in their home, thought they had too many plants, took all their equipment, took all their plants, arrested them, put them in the back of a squad car. I'll never forget one lady, I won't mention her name, but she was 68 years old, severely disabled, and she was coughed and put in the back of a squad car. Uh, these are like cops that are wearing, you know, flak jackets and have tasers and guns. Um, so, anyhow, I will uh, change directions here and talk about the use of cannabinoids in the treatment of ALS. I'm going to go through this very quickly. Um, we've actually been able to show now in a mouse model that cannabinoids extend the life of the mouse by about 50 percent. They literally double the lifespan of the mouse. And they also delay the onset. We've already published the delay in onset, but now we carry the study out and show these mice live twice as long. And despite what the federal government tells you, cannabinoids are actually good for nerves and the nervous system. And Donald can tell you that with treating HIV and neuropathic pain. 
Um, I'm not going to bore you with the chemistry here. There are some other similar compounds. Um, uh, anybody that eats dark chocolate, good dark chocolate, and kind of catches a little bit of a buzz off of that, that's from the flavonoids that are found in chocolate, which are very chemically similar to, car to uh, the 21 carbon compound to terpene, which the cannabinoids fall under. Actually, uh, tamoxifen, which is used for treatment of breast cancer, uh, is now being looked at as a treatment for ALS because it's a 21 carbon compound terpene. And there was a woman who was written up in a case report in neurology. By the way, uh, neurology is an outstanding journal, so I think it's every bit as good as a New England journal. And frankly, I can tell you that because I've had some of the papers rejected from neurology. <laughs> <laughs> so, to get a paper published in neurology was a big achievement. Yeah. Um, at any rate, there was a woman who was being treated for breast cancer and then developed ALS, and she was being treated with tamoxifen, and she's still alive to this day. Uh, and it turns out tamoxifen is very closely related to cannabinoids, this 21 carbon ter uh, terpene. So, uh, again, going through this quickly, we now know that we make our own cannabinoids. We have receptors in the brain, CD1 receptors, and re uh, receptors in the peripheral nervous system, CD2 receptors. It's really an ideal set of compounds to treat neurodegenerative diseases. Um, I'm going to spill a little, little bit out of the bag here. We have some data which we haven't yet published. We don't have enough data to publish it, frankly. Um, in fact, I'm going to try to get up MVP for some funding today if I can find it. Um, but we looked at, we did this in the mouse initially when we were doing some of the earlier trials. We've actually shown a down regulation of cannabinoid receptors in the spinal fluid of mice with the SOD limitations of the model of ALS. And now we have a few patients that we actually have that uh, data in humans. Um, interestingly, as another aside, just to sort of change gears here, Paul Armentano. Where are you, Paul? Let's give it. I mean, this guy deserves a round of applause. 